Good afternoon, and uh, thanks for joining me on this last day of the conference. I um, appreciate you taking time out of this afternoon to uh, have a discussion about geodata and how we represent geodata in arches. Um, just by um, way of a little bit of background, um, I'm the CEO of a geospatial system integration <coughs> company, so GIS and geodata development company, located in San Francisco, California. And uh, I'll be, I have the honor of presenting a group effort. Uh, not only the efforts of uh, my colleagues here in the front row, Dennis and Allison from the WMF and the Getty, but my technical team back in San Francisco. So what I'd like to do for the next few moments is um, spend some time sharing our understanding of um, how a, a modern uh, cultural heritage management system ought to approach storing and managing geodata. Um, Arches is a system, brand new system that we're developing, and it's meant to manage cultural heritage data. And, and when I say cultural heritage data, and you, you'll hear me use that term throughout the talk, what I really mean are the data uh, needed to describe archaeological and, and built heritage. And that, so that would include all the things that you're used to thinking about, as well as information about actors, um, activities and events, uh, documentation, that sort of thing. Really, ARCHES is meant to be a comprehensive cultural heritage management system. And we stop at worrying about managing collections, for example, in a, in a, in a museum. Um, to give you a little bit of background, what I'd like to do is uh, help you understand what ARCHES is meant to do. And really, our approach was to partner with some um, domain experts, so people in this field who spend their days really worried about and concerned about managing cultural heritage data. Uh, in particular, we've worked very closely with English Heritage and the Flemish Heritage Agency, which is uh, I guess the Dutch speaking part of Belgium, and according to them, the good part of Belgium. <laughs> uh, we also are working quite closely with the city of Los Angeles, and we've spent uh, quite a number of years working with the Department of Antiquities in Jordan. So, in this collaboration, we've learned, I think, quite a bit about what some of the requirements are for managing cultural heritage data. And one of the things that has fallen out of that is that everybody has their own specific ways of modeling or describing cultural heritage. The whole premise of ARCHES is to make sure that we can manage cultural heritage so that we can better avoid this kind of problem, where policy decisions are made that threaten cultural heritage. So really, the aim of ARCHES is to inform policymakers to make better decisions about uh, infrastructure development. So whether we're talking about a new dam, or a new highway alignment, or a new development of some sort, what we're really hoping to do is provide the right kind of information for decisions that can help preserve and conserve cultural heritage. This is our real aim of ARCHES. We're also hoping that ARCHES can be deployed anywhere in the world. And so that means that uh, we already understand the richness and the complexity of cultural heritage data. And this little graphic here is just a, a visual way of trying to represent the interconnectedness of cultural heritage information. It's really quite complex, and ARCHES is meant to be able to manage this sort of information in a coherent fashion. <clears throat> of course, to support our goal of conserving and preserving cultural heritage, ARCHES also needs to know something about the extent the location and extent of, of heritage resources. And typically when we talk about the extent, we're really talking about mapping. And mapping traditionally has been the purview of GIS. And uh, quite a rich discussion earlier today about the role of GIS. And from the perspective of ARCHES, it really has two roles. It has the role of um, improving data management. <coughs> and, uh, and ARCHES certainly takes advantage of that. And it also has the role of enabling analyses, and, um, and ARCHES certainly takes advantage of that. And it has a third role, really, of um, allowing for richer visualizations, so pictures as opposed to tables that help communicate 
uh, relationships much more effectively than, say, an Excel spreadsheet might. The problem, of course, with GIS, and, and if you've worked with GIS at all, you see it right away, and that is that in a traditional GIS, we have what is considered a, you know, a layer-based model. That is to say, you define features. Features have, by definition, a geometry primitive associated with them and a collection of attributes. And this would be a very, a very uh, um, standard kind of way of describing a particular feature. You, you identify a, a, a shape, in this case it's a polygon, and you define some attributes that describe that shape. So if this were to be, say, uh, uh, if it were meant to represent an archaeological site or a cultural heritage resource of some sort, you'd have to a priori decide how you wanted to describe that thing. And the, the decisions that you might make in Jordan could be quite different than the decisions that are made in, say, Belgium or in Los Angeles or in England. So we run into this really quite fundamental problem of the, the, the way GIS really describes data and its requirement for you to be quite explicit in the information that you want to associate with, uh, with position. Really, in 20 years of working on geospatial projects, like, it's been my experience that, in essence, pretty much every GIS database is custom. And, and that is a reality of the way the application is used. And in some ways, not a, not a, it's an unsurprising observation. You know, in this, in this sense, GIS is often used in the same way that Excel is used, which is to say that it's a tool in which you create information, and that information creation is essentially unconstrained. So even though you might, you might run into uh, institutions that are all worried about managing cultural heritage, they all do it in just a slightly enough different way that the databases end up being really quite different. And um, that's a real problem if you want to build software that can be deployed anywhere in the world. So we have this really quite fundamental problem. We want to build software that is easily deployable and configurable and can be used anywhere in the world and is capable of describing and managing a rich and complex cultural heritage data set. And at the same time, we want it to be geospatially aware. We want to take all advantage of all the of all the 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 opportunities that GIS affords us. So the visualization, the analysis, and the, the data management of geospatial objects. What do we do? It, it, at first glance, seems to be a bit of an impasse. And one possible approach is to rethink how we structure the data. And in Arches, we've done exactly this. We're really looking at taking advantage of a graph um, description or a graph data model for geospatial data specifically. And I realize that many of you are really already familiar with, with graph data structure, but for, for those of you for whom it's a, a new idea, this is a really simple way to, th to think of it, and that is to imagine um, two objects or two nodes and a relationship between them. So in the parlance, it's nodes and edges in a, a really good handy back of the, you know, back pocket way of thinking about it is to think about sort of object one, object two, and their relationships to one another. Um, I've just shown uh, the simplest graph that you can here, that you can possibly show, but they can get quite, they can get quite involved very, very quickly. Does this help us at all? And the answer is, at least concept conceptually, yes, it does. You can think about GIS or geodata in a graph structure in something along these lines. You have a cultural heritage resource, and it has a relationship with a geometry. That's a about as simple a way of thinking about geodata in a graph format as, as, as you can. Now, the problem with graph databases is that they're essentially unconstrained in, in how you choose to define your nodes. So I can decide that any, I can, I, it's sort of arbitrary for me to decide what I want to treat as a node, and the edges or the properties that connect those nodes can also be quite arbitrary. So what you very quickly realize is to do a graph database in a meaningful way, it, it helps very much to have an ontology or a structured language for describing what, you, what your terms mean. And in our case, we've chosen to adopt 
the CDOC CRM as our guiding underlying ontology. So the CRM is really the, the language that we use to define what we mean when we start describing the participants in our graph. So the actual cultural heritage data entities that we're talking about are all essentially a link to a CRM entity. And that way, we tie very fundamentally our description of data with an ontology that sits, that, that sits independently of it. It's a way of ensuring that we all talk a, a standard language and that our data, the data within Arches, is, is uh, tied to an internationally accepted and, uh, and, and actually quite sophisticated and capable ontology for cultural heritage. In Arches, we've actually gone to the effort of defining a suite of cultural heritage objects or data entities. In, in our terminology, we call them, we really we call it, we, we refer to the information that Arches manages as entities, and entities can be graphed into categories. So I'm showing you here a screenshot that represents the set of default entities that Arches had, had, is configured with, and that would come with in the standard way. So some of the, uh, some of the interesting things to look at are these categories of information. For example, uh, categories of information used to describe a particular cultural heritage resource might include uh, the materials and techniques that are associated with that resource, or the time periods and the, the typologies that resource represents, uh, or measurements made around that resource, or in fact, location. So in the specific case of defining a graph or a structure for managing data in Arches, and specifically geodata, uh, this graph really represents maybe um, a more realistic way of, of describing geospatial information. It, uh, you know, perhaps it's a better way of defining the relationship between an entity and its descriptive geometry. So in a case like this, we've used the CRM to inform the graph. So a typical way to look at this would be to say that an E27 object, a site, has a location that is a place. And that place is identified by a suite of geospatial coordinates. In fact, this is a very simple graph that we have implemented in Arches specifically for the purpose of managing the relationship between geodata and cultural heritage resources, data resources. Now what I'd like to do that bit of background is um, walk through how we actually implement that. So it's one thing to talk about theoretically how does it work. It's another thing to talk about can it work, and if so, how does it work. And I'm going to switch gears a little bit now and talk about the way we actually implement this in Arches. And so forewarned is forearmed. We're going to enter the world of uh, data models and tables very quickly here. And if you feel the need for a bathroom break or <laughs> coffee is really calling downstairs, uh, I, won't, I won't stop you. Um, I'll just start off by saying that we use PostGIS as the underlying database management system. And for those of you who know anything about PostGIS, probably two things come to mind. The first is, it's a really, it's an exceptional piece of technology. It's, a, it's an open source, geospatially aware database management system. It's, it's in my opinion, it's, a, it's one of the best examples of what open source software can offer. And the second thing you might be thinking is, it's a relational database and you're talking about graph structures, and so how do we make that work? And that's what we'll be talking about here shortly. Um, this is the obligatory ERD diagram. Uh, I show this only to give you a sense of the fact that it's a comprehensive data model. And secondly, that you can use relational data structures to manage graphs. But I don't, wouldn't, I'm definitely not asking you to memorize this or even look at it any more closely than that. But what I do want to do is focus on the core part of this data model. And that would include what you see here in the middle. And I'll talk about what that middle bit is. But that is, in essence, the, it's, the, it's the heart of, of how we manage data in Arches. And it starts with a table that we call the entity types table. And the way to think of this is to think of a table that stores your complete listing of all the data objects that you wish to manage Arches. So that would include things like archaeological sites, artifacts, cultural periods, materials, P 
people, events, all those things, down to a very fine level of detail. It might include things like record compilation date. So anything that you want to track in Arches goes into this table, including geometries. This is the class of things that you care about. So when I say MD types, what I'm really talking about are classes or categories of information. Because we're using the CRM as our ontology, thank you, um, we also include in Arches a table to track every CRM entity. Uh, so everything that's in the CRM is in the, is in the database. And what you'll find is the data model requires a relationship between our entity types or our categories and our CRM classes. So an example would be, let's say we want to manage archaeological sites. We would then link, say, the archaeological site to an E27 site entity. And in that way, we have formally associated our, uh, our concept, the concept of an archaeological site, with an ontology, with a a formally defined uh, semantic model. I talked about graphs, and we have to keep track of how the graphs relate these various classes. And we have a table called rules in which we load every single graph that necessary to describe the relationships between category classes. And of course, entity types are participants. So every single rule, every single graph, references and a new type in the database. So what do we have so far? We have the definition of categories that Arches is, data categories that Arches is going, to, is going to track. We've defined what we mean by those terms, and we have mapped how the various entities, how the various categories relate to one another. So the way to say that in English is archaeological sites have time periods associated with them. That is a graph, and that graph is in the mappings. The categories are the archaeological site and the cultural period, and the definitions for those two things are the CRM. And then finally, we have to start actually collecting the information. So an example here is an entity would be an instance of a category. So Stonehenge is an instance of an archaeological site. This point is an instance of a geometry. And the last thing we do is we keep track of all the specific relationships. So the graph of specific individual entities, the individual instances that are participants in that, in that graph. And that's, that's what it looks like. So all that gobbledygook that I showed you a few slides ago, really all you have to do is understand that this is the, this is the logical relationship between things. How does that help us? Uh, that would be my question, and, and I think it's a fair question. It helps us in this way. What Arches does, basically, is nothing more than recursively query the two tables, the entities table and the relations table, to build an object, a JSON object, that describes the complete graph for an archaeological resource. Again, in English, what that means is you can say, I want to find out what do I know about Stonehenge, and Arches will recursively go through and figure out every single relationship across all those entities and come back with a description, serializes JSON so that we can interact with it. And the way we interact with it is we use that JSON to push that graph to the front end, the client application. In this case, it's a JavaScript using ext and open layers. And we are now free to build a user interface that lets us interact with just those portions of, of that graph that we care about. So in this case, this might be a, in fact, this is a, a data form, data entry form, for allowing a, a registered user to add the description, the geospatial description for a resource. And a couple things to point out here. One is, it's super flexible. So I can choose to describe any resource with any collection of geometry primitives that are appropriate. So in Jordan, for example, certain archaeologists are absolutely convinced that in some cases the best way to describe the extent of an uh, artifact is with a point. And you can do that. 
In other cases, the best description is using a line string. And this interface lets you choose to do that. In other cases, a polygon is the best model for the location. And in fact, in the general case, you can use whatever you use whatever combination of these primitives that you need to to describe the location and extent of any resource in Arches. And that's a very flexible way, and it's a very universally applicable way of supporting data collection and data description for Arches, no, ma no matter whether it's being deployed in Jordan or Los Angeles. And uh, while we can debate about how easy to use this user interface is, it's certainly a very flexible approach. So an example here would be uh, clicking on the add point and digitizing the, the circle up there, or the point up there, and then clicking on a, the add polygon and digitizing a polygon. And the archaeologist, the person who has actually has the most information about how to describe that particular resource, is at liberty to do so. By now, you've probably come to the conclusion that the real benefit to doing it this way is that we can treat geospatial data in exactly the same way that we treat any other kind of data. It is a participant in the underlying data model, in the underlying graph structure, in exactly the same way that any other information entity is. And, perhaps even more importantly, it's tied to the CRM as well, which means it has semantic meaning, which means that we can define in our graph the very specific semantic structure that we want for the relationships between geodata and cultural heritage resources. So when I started out by saying the aim of ARCHES is to conserve and preserve cultural heritage anywhere in the world, the reason we go to this effort is so that we can, so that we can do this, so that ARCHES, out of the box, is absolutely able to manage the workflows that have been defined for describing cultural heritage in Jordan, in Belgium, in England, in Los Angeles, and really anywhere. And uh, with that, I will thank you for your attention. And um, if there are any questions, we have to take them. Thank you for your interesting paper. Some uh, questions? Yes. Can I use the, uh, the interface to build my own kind of data model, what I, what I believe that I want to put into the database, thematic data model, like the geometers on one side, we saw that we can input them, and now can I, am I able to, I want to record monuments, or even I want to record certain locations in the map, and to put in some information according to CIM classes, and this kind of, the user has a certain data model in his mind, is he able to represent that? Yeah, so I think, Gerald, your question is, can you define your own graphs, essentially? Yeah. And the answer is yes, you can. You can define, you can define whatever graphs that you want to that, would, that would allow for the connection between, say, a monument and a geospatial description. That's one of the things that we think people will do what we've tried to do is remove that requirement for people who may not feel comfortable with CRM. So that's why we have default mappings. We basically said for Arches to be easy to use, easy to implement, we'd like to provide a starting point. And that starting point is a set of graphs that you can inspect and you can modify if you want to. And all you have to do is use the CRM to decide how you want to build your mappings. And you're free to replace our default mappings with the mappings that you want to use. And in fact, to just extend on that a little bit, there, we're, we also expect that there will be data types that we haven't defined by default that you might be interested in. And that pattern, Arches expects that people will say, well, there's in additional information, additional entities that I want to manage. And all you have to do is define the mappings and load those mappings into Arches. And it would be aware of that. You might need to, do, might need to develop your own data entry forms, potentially. But it's free to be, you're free to define whatever mappings you want. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so do you have an RDF triple store that sits on top of post GIS where you store all of these graphs? Uh, that's a great question, and the answer is we don't. We have, it, if you recall, it was a table I called a relations table, mm -hmm. which is in effect a triple store, but it hasn't been converted into an RDF format. And one of our, really it's on our roadmap, 
uh, ultimately to think about how to take that and publish it as RBF triples. So we're very much thinking about how to do that, but really in the early stages of, of gathering requirements for how to do that properly. Because yeah, if you've done that, then you know you then have access to the linked open data mm -hmm. web, and you can easily link different Arches implementations. And, you know, That's exactly a lot more right. More reasoning that you could do as well. So you're, we're thinking exactly mm -hmm. along those lines too. Mm -hmm. Where ultimately we expect that Arches will be deployed. Um, at, on an institution by institution basis, mm -hmm. but these data models really are built to participate in, in an open linked data cloud, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. ideally that's what how people would at least choose to just to publish at least some parts of their Arches database as RDF mm -hmm. triples, mm -hmm. and then that sort of federation, that sort of interoperability would be something that we could realistically talk about. Mm -hmm. It's a very good question. Some more. Um, can I can I implement types? How did you think about? Yeah, this? so that's a good question too. So I didn't actually show it in that simple graph, but the end of really any graph can be an E55 type, and so and in fact that's what we do in a lot of cases. So if you look at the way Arches implements uh, materials, for example, or cultural periods, or anything that you'd like to manage as a controlled vocabulary, really. The end node is an E55 type that points to it in, at the source. And so Arches actually does implement the SORI that are used to manage those controlled vocabularies. So it's really just adding the E55 type mm -hmm. in your graph. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.